<laughs> oh dear. Have you pressed record? Yeah, we're recording. Oh, really? We are recording. Why is yours blue? Yeah, yours, red. yours goes red. Yeah. Why hasn't it gone red? Oh, because I haven't pressed record on there. We haven't got a memory card in the broadcaster. You want one? No, because we record it directly on the PC. On oh. The Mac. Ow. Oh, okay. It's plugged. It goes through into the garage. Yes. Ah, yeah. you're recording. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, we need you with us wherever we go, really, Will, because we're absolutely... Yeah, we use OBS. To record the audio? Yeah. Interesting. Mm. It's better quality than anything else that I've tried. Yeah. You could use GarageBand. Yep, I haven't thought of trying GarageBand. Oh, GarageBand is the uh, the Apple, Apple one. one, isn't it? Yeah. Should we try but GarageBand for the next one? I don't know how, how long you can record for on Garage. Just use OBS if it works. It works, so... No, just don't, yeah. don't change it. No. What's going on, everybody? Yeah. Hello. <laughs> it's a bit weird. Is it it's sh- weird. That's <laughs> how so you start your yeah. podcast, isn't it? It's re- it is really, really odd. We need to get used to like a proper intro. <gasps> oh, shit. Just, are we allowed to swear on this podcast? <laughs> well, we have to now. We're now an only <laughs> podcast because your mum swears so much. I don't own I do not swear. <laughs> I was thinking that, that in the shower. Who's going to swear more, mum or me? No, no. I am really good now. No, you swear all. I had to have words. Yeah? Yeah, there was a podcast we were doing and I said, oh, it's another one I've got to edit out. <laughs> and then she said, well, just don't edit it out. I yeah, said, don't okay, edit it well, out. Just put it as explicit now we're only. An explicit podcast. Yeah, but when you upload it, do you upload it as it's kids friendly? Um, on YouTube, yes. Yeah, I wouldn't. No, sorry. No, we don't do that on YouTube. Okay, yeah. But when we upload the podcast to the podcast on software. Buzz, yeah. Yeah, then that. Choose. I was choosing that it was not explicit. Whereas now, oh, have you to, have to put the explicit because, button. Yeah. yeah well, we do now. Was I do not swear a lot. <laughs> swear I learn it from mum. Well, exactly, swear I learn it from. Yeah. <laughs> I've got. Yeah, I, it wasn't from dad. I, I, I've got to admit that is probably the case. You did probably learn it from me. And um, yeah, dad doesn't. I don't think really I've swear. ever heard your dad swear. No, he doesn't really Very swear. Rarely. Very rare. And he certainly doesn't swear in front of a lady. No. Why no. no. then? Yeah, he hasn't sworn in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've been been told off. Sorry. I know. I love it that Will comes in and try and like controls the change turns. the layout of everything. It's and... his OCD. You can't hack it. No, I can't. I really so, can't. So it's you, cool little setup, though. It it's is. Cool. I'm dead pleased with yeah. it. I think it's really nice. I'd just like to be able to do it on my own as well. Not that I want to do it on my own because I love it. She's been you off. She's been you out. <laughs> <laughs> She'll the be added to next podcast. week. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Sorry, Mike. Don't need you anymore. No, I Angie just... Clark. <laughs> <laughs> You're a little stirrer. <laughs> I swear, though. I didn't swear, though. I was really good. Oh, no. We're getting oh, disturbed again, are we? getting involved. The family, family <laughs> podcast. That's it. So, so why do you keep <laughs> spilling your drink? <laughs> makes no sense why it keeps spilling. Do you spilling. need a bib? <laughs> I reckon it's nerves. It's nerves being on our podcast. It's just looking at you both. <laughs> doing it. <laughs> so, all of our podcasts are generally about people's lives and... Um, where they're at and where they're not at and various other bits and pieces and I'm going to divorce the man that keeps coming in and out of the front door in a minute. Your, your father? It's definitely <laughs> not your father. <laughs> it's your, it's your father. husband. <coughs> so, where do you want to start? Tell us about your life. It's really weird because it's like, you guys know everything about my life. I know. So it's like... <laughs> I don't think so. I don't know everything about your life. Well, no. I do. But Mostly. Other bits that he doesn't want me to know, he doesn't tell me. So. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and I don't need to know that. <laughs> Victoria, they went out to dinner. William went out. I think you were there. With, yeah, you with were. Ryan, with Ryan. Oh, manager. yeah, yeah. And there was a whole conversation about... and was Victor- friends. My friends. For <laughs> <laughs> fuck's sake. <laughs> friend in different countries. Busted me. And he was busted. Yeah. So that's it. They liked that gossip, didn't they? Yeah, gossip's great. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't know. Where, where do you so want to So I start? suppose you're, I mean, most people that watch this probably don't even know what you do for a living. So. <laughs> I don't understand this bottle. <coughs> do you want to change the bottle real quick? No, it's fine. We're done. Just give up with it. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so so tell, but, us, tell us about how you started. I think that was the... I think I, I started... Well, let's tell everybody what you do first. So I, I DJ and make music. That's yeah. it. That's it. Um... I started, I think, when I was nine years old. I, we have, like, a family friend that Dad used to play rugby with called Tomo. Um, he did used to play rugby with. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a local caravan site called, it, it used to be called Broadway Caravan Site in Cheddar. 
um, which is for anybody that doesn't know a caravan site that's listening out of the UK, it's like a holiday park um, that people go and stay at, really. Um, vacation park. I think the if you're American. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he, they used to throw like discos. It was like a family fair. Like people would play bingo and everything like that. And that's kind of where I first started doing discos, I guess, at the time. And then when I was, I think I was 11, um, dad took me to see Faithless at, at Newport Leisure Centre. Um, you weren't supposed to go there then? No, right? he like made an excuse up for school, said that I got the dentist and then took me. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. And um, I think from then it, I kind of knew, I was always into electronic music and then it just started from there, I think. No, it started before, but it was then when I was like, this is exactly what I want to do. At the same time, I was playing a lot of rugby and I thought it was either I wanted to be a rugby player um or music and i think i realized as i got older that i'm way too small to be a rugby player thanks to my amazing genetics <laughs> <laughs> All right. um, and injury had set in already so it was music um and when i was 12 years old we were in i can't remember the shop what it was called but it's called pmt now it's like a big um music shop in it's kind of a national music shop in the UK, but it, I think it was called Music Technology in Bristol. in Bristol. And it's like a music shop. And we were there. I was 12. Um, God, I vividly remember yeah. that now. And mum saw a poster that said the DJ Academy and was like, oh, why don't you do this? Um, <coughs> and it was like a 10-week course of like DJ lessons Okay, in Bristol. Um, I think you guys got it for me for, for my birthday or something. Um, and we went up. Dad would take me up every Monday night. And it was in a place called Fiesta Havana, which is on Corn Street in Bristol, which is next to Vodka Revs. It's slug and lettuce now. Um, and we took the upstairs. There was, there was about 30 of us in total. And it was split. It was like a big... Like it was a national, um, almost school that would go around teaching DJ lessons, but it was like more so teaching the whole industry at that time in like in well 2002. So, what the industry was like in 2002 is very okay. different to what it is now. And, um, so in there, I turned up the first night, and there's like everyone's like. 25 30 and i'm just a little 12 year old <laughs> rocking up and they're like who the hell is this kid yeah. bringing my dad um you have to stay with you as well he he stayed he stayed the first like hour on the first first time and then he just i think he was was he training to be a counselor then yeah i think he so was i think he was doing well doing a bit of college work you did the rest <laughs> um, <laughs> um I, I, so he would just do work in the car or downstairs. Um, but the, the the whole course was split up into like three, like intermediate, like people that could already DJ that were just honing the skills, people that could like kind of DJ and then the beginners. And I was in the beginners because I didn't have, I didn't have a clue what DJing was. I didn't know what you had to put two records put together and turn it into one. Um, so yeah, it was, we learned on vinyl. And then also on that on that course, it was about like learning how to promote yourself in that day and age. So you'd like be taught how to record a demo CD and how to like create artwork for the demo CD. Okay. And it was like a whole, it was split up into two. So it was like the practical and then the theory. So it wasn't just like a bunch of people throwing a, trying to like throw a party every week. It was like, it had, you had like course notes and I think I've still got the notes somewhere on, wow. on it. Yeah, yeah. Still um, refer back to them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm recording podcasts. Um, <laughs> and then the whole, the end of the whole, after the 10 weeks, everyone, the whole point is after 10 weeks, everyone's good enough to DJ and we all throw a party. Okay. So like we all play at like for like, 
45 minutes at the club that we we both put a night on together oh. and we have to like make the flyers and do all of that sounds good fun yeah and i think it was called like melting pot it was yeah it was um i remember <clears throat> i can't i got kicked out of the club the night yeah you did because i was 30 i ju- i turned 13 and we'd okayed it with the manager but the security guard didn't know oh no so i was just like mooching around and then the security guard just was like you gotta get out um and i was stuck outside for a bit <laughs> <laughs> but oh. yeah, I remember my school teacher, Miss Hearn. Can you remember Miss Hearn? Yeah. She came. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah she she did. came. She, she invited her or she yeah, just yeah. Nice no, yeah, out? yeah. She I invited her. So yeah, I think I was yeah, I was 13 then. Um and it kind of started from there. And then from Melting Pot, there was like so the whole the whole point of the reason why it was called Melting Pot was because there was so many different genres of music that we'd that we'd all play. And back then nights were very much like different genres okay so like in one room you'd have one genre in another room you'd have another genre and kind of it was way more like inclusive where now it's a lot more like genre specific on on nights um and the the reason why it's called mountain pot was because there were so many different genres in them but then after that a few of us kind of kept in touch and started a night called new city sound and that was with a few it was weird because like it was with matt Matt Johnson, he's like a lawyer solicitor. Um, Dan Macy, he was he wasn't on the course, but he got in touch with us. Um, Andy, yeah, I, he got he was through Matt though, wasn't he? Yeah, a lot of them were through Matt. Simon was through Matt. Um, you met Simon in motion a couple yeah, of weeks ago yeah, yeah. with his wife. Um, and there was a few other people. And we'd like just throw parties in Bristol. Like, realistically, we had no fucking clue what we were doing. <laughs> um, but we had some good times. And then Love it that. kind of started from there. And I think at that time, <clears throat> it was still vinyl. Um, CDs were coming in, but I was buying my records from a shop called Spin Central in Western Supermare, which is actually probably near one of your houses. It's no, it's no longer there. Yeah, I think I know where you yeah, mean. Yeah, yeah. Just off the high street, down yeah. down the side, um, near that public toilet. It's like the weird public toilet thing. Weird public toilet in the middle, of, like opposite <laughs> the McDonald's. Oh, that's long gone. Oh, is it? Yeah. I or the clock? Are you talking about the clock? I don't know. There's a fancy clock that you used to have it's in like the a middle. Big point. Yeah, it wasn't a toilet. It was a clock. Oh. <laughs> it's still there, isn't it? We'll use it as a toilet. Clearly. <laughs> it's still there, isn't it? The clock no, opposite that's... McDonald's. When they repaved it, did they get rid of it all? There's, there's a carrot there now. A what? A carrot. <laughs> a oh, no. carrot? Yeah, carrots. There's, there's a carrot there now. What's a carrot? The, the, the vegetable. Know, the vegetable. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a big carrot there now. There. It's called the carrot, yeah. Oh. I'll, I'll um, put a little picture on the podcast. Yeah. People can see what we're talking about. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? And then, um, yeah, at that place, the Southwest was known for, like, hard more hard style types of music like hard house hardcore drum and bass um and i was playing like way more like funky soulful house and then at spin central uh there was a girl called miss divine at the time um her name her real name sam who is now sam divine she was like the house buyer of the spin central record shop Okay. So I'd go down after school. You, no, it wasn't. We you used to, you used to take me. Yeah. Um, the weekends. On the weekends after I'd finished working at the chip shop and uh, go and buy some records from her. And we just kind of like, I I was the kind of the only person in the local area that was buying house music off her. She would always like ship it out to people in Bristol or ship it out to people in Cardiff. Um, so it was like, we kind of just built a friendship up. I then played a show in Western for her, I which is, <clears throat> so you know, the pier, yep. you know you, the entrance of the pier, if you're, if you've got the pier behind you and you go straight over the road and you've got the ice cream shops and stuff like that. Yes. So you, it was above there. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know what it's called now, but it's not a venue. It was up there. I think that's all flats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. You probably turn them into flats. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, 
that was my first show with her. And then she moved to Ibiza. Um, I was 15 then when my first show with her. And then uh, I played a show with her. And then she moved to Ibiza. Has got a residency at a place called Hush, which is like a bar in the West End. Was a bar in the West End. Um, the West End is like super chavy place where everyone in the UK would go over to Ibiza and just get absolutely blasted. <laughs> um, but Hush was like the cooler bar of the West End. It was like where all the so there's a thing called workers in Ibiza. So you have the people that go in and all the people that work there, <laughs> and there's a Back then, especially, there was a huge worker community. Um, and what would ha happen is after a lot of the bars would close, Hush would carry on staying open. And then all the workers would go and party at Hush. So Sam was a resident and she asked me to go and play there when I was I was 16. I remember going out there with you guys for a week and then Victoria and her, who's my sister, um, her boyfriend at the time came out. And then we came out again. No, uh, you came out. Oh, this it, we just did two weeks there did when we were sixteen, and then the year after from that, I was like, okay, I need, I want to be in Ibiza more, um, and then the year after, I say, I yeah, seventeen. So I'd saved up to go and stay out there for like a month and a half. <laughs> you guys came out for like a week, and then right. found a place. Found a place for me to stay, and then the minute I, the first night I moved, they told me, "Oh, we have to move out, and you're on your own." So oh. I was like 17 in Ibiza, going, "Where the fuck am I going to live?" <laughs> like I had no idea. Um, we were on the plane by you then. Were, yeah, you guys had left. So by the time I I'd made a few like friends from a place called Orange Corner, which it was like a it's like a beach bar restaurant, but back then they. It, there would be a lot more partying in the day and it was kind of a bit of a wild place at some times. Um, ben and Alexi, they were the PRs. It's weird. I, can't, I wonder what they're up to these days. Um, they kind of like took me under their wing and they were like, we've got a spare mattress on our floor in, nice. <laughs> in our apartment. You can come and stay and just rent that off us. And at that time, it was there was three people in the lounge, and Ben and Lexi in the bedroom. So there was five people in a one bedroom apartment. <laughs> wow! <laughs> All sharing the same bathroom. Lovely. It was gross. Um, one of them, one of them was a secure. One of the guys was a security guard from Eden, which is a nightclub there. And then another one of the girls was like a French. French exchange student. She's not. She was just French, but I don't know why I think she she was just like on holiday from France but stayed there for longer. Um Yeah, and that was kind of it was in like a big workers' apartment block. So it was like just constant parties. You didn't really sleep much. It was like it was weird. it was a massive eye opener. Yeah. Massive eye opener for me. Um because it's like I'm seventeen and everyone around me is like 20 like there's a few 18 year olds but like the difference between 17 and 18 in life especially because you are legally allowed to go out partying in the uk so everyone's partied and everything like that i was i know i was like going to my first experience in a club was when i was 13 but like it's just still different when you're 18 to sure like, yeah to, so it was yeah it was it was fun but then i i got um friendly with one of the residents, a guy called Robin, one of the residents from Orange Corner. And I played a few times. It was actually a guy called Jamie Gittens who first put me at um, Orange Corner. I played there a few times and then I got friendly with the resident, Robin. Jamie was the old resident. Robin took it on from Jamie. Okay. Um, and we just stayed friends. Um, and then he... The next summer, I went back after a month and a half. I had to go back to college. So we started college again, and I was doing music technology at the time in Bridgewater. Um, was that a value to you to do that, do you think? What, Bridgewater College? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I loved that time. It was, I don't know. I think because like after school, when you're 
you have to do school right and as much as i i made a good time of school like i had a fun because i did sport sport was the only thing that kind of kept me going through school that i did well at really let's be honest like i didn't want to do well at anything else but and music was shit at school like music it's very different is that to the real yeah. world and mr taylor um he was a wanker like he was he told me that I'd never have a career in music and electronic music wasn't a genre of music. So it's like, <laughs> it was. Basically, it, you're not going to have a career. Yeah. And then ask you to teach else. all the kids how to do it. Didn't yeah. They? yeah. It was just like, it was just not a healthy environment for creative people. Was that school? at school? That was Kings. Yeah. 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 Right. But like I had rugby and rugby yeah. and sport was like, what kind of, for me was just like, I'm not like an intelli- like an intellectual type of person. So like to get my GCSEs, I like I had to work fucking hard to pass, if you know what I mean. Um so it's so co- going to college, which in the UK is sixteen to eighteen, so it's almost like high school in America or in most cases. It was just like gave me a chance to actually do what I want to do and not be treated like a kid. Yeah. In a world where like I think for the because at school there's a hierarchy between the teachers and the and the students. I think because I've been around so many older people in music, like since I was twelve, twelve, thirteen, like you kind of wanted to build a relationship with people, but you just couldn't do that with teachers. Yeah, and if you've got a teacher who's telling you that you know the music you're interested in, the music you want to be yeah. in, it, 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 there is no career in it. It's yeah, a bit, yeah, I imagine that's really. I mean, from a mental health perspective, that must be horrific. I don't know, because I didn't really... <clears throat> he was just a twat. And the parents him? did step in and <laughs> sort him out. Did the parents do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I yeah, felt we... sorry for any teacher. I, I can imagine. Let's be honest. Come yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. That's scary, right? Yeah. Have you, have you ever spoken to that teacher since leaving no. school? No. <laughs> I used to work with his son at the fish and chip shop. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, and his actually his wife also taught me in Fairlands. Oh, I see. So English teacher. She nice. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's really weird, teachers, because it's, it's funny. Like, I I don't know if you you have friends that are teachers that are our age. I don't know. Yeah, you do. I do. You yeah. Do. Um, and like I've got friends now that are teachers, and you forget when you're at school that your teachers are like our age now or like and yeah. younger but all the teachers that i remember that were absolutely dickheads were like super old mm. at the time so like old now like your age thanks <laughs> <laughs> but when you're like 15 it seems super old yeah. doesn't it but i guess it wasn't all of them just different people but i think the weird thing with teachers is now is you see your mates like going out partying doing getting up to what they get up to and then they go and teach kids the next day and you're like how is that possible yeah <laughs> like yeah. it should not be allowed but yeah it's kind of funny well i suppose <laughs> teachers sometimes forget that kids grow up 100 percent. you know so therefore their opinion they their yeah. opinions that they kind of almost force onto you as a young yeah, yeah. person is yeah. like actually this guy's gonna grow up into a grown-up and and his own career and and you're going to probably see them around the village because we live yeah. in such a small village that yeah. it's like you're probably going to see them. Um, who was that really hot teacher? It was old teacher. No, hot, hot teacher. The hot teacher. Oh. Miss Kieran would know. Oh, um, she, was like, she was like a substitute. Yeah, right? yeah. she was a substitute. And she, I remember, like when we were when we'd finished, we like all like we all went out to Vision when it was Vision at the time. It was like all you can drink, and like we like seeing her out and it was like <laughs> such a weird thing because it but, was like she would have been probably 21 22 yeah she was and yeah, we yeah. Were 15 16. 16 which in you don't think about it though you don't expect to see <laughs> and like we had another teacher called mr weber science yes, teacher science guy and he <clears throat> pulled me aside one night and was like just a heads up i think i went out with your sister-in-law last night <laughs> and emma was friends with him at, at the time and i was just like it's kind of weird because you're like you're at the age where you're like nearly 
a grown up. Nearly a grown up, but you're not. <laughs> yeah. And you kind of have to go. But like going to college was amazing. The like head shooter, a guy called Ben Amos, he was like, re- had a reasonable career in uh, drum and bass. Um, and he was wicked. He's such a nice. I still speak to him now. And then Ben Allen, uh, Ben Houlihan was like the other guy part of the course. He would, he would teach the live side. Ben Amos would teach the like, production side. Nice. Um, but yeah, it was, that was the best time. And did that education. condense your knowledge then in a sense or did it? <laughs> I think realistically, I, yes, I probably learned stuff, but I don't think it was like, would I learn more? being in the industry and just doing it yeah i would have but i feel like you kind of i had to like have a start of something of start a pack if you know what i mean yeah, of, yeah. it's like the foundations yeah and i think it's also like you work out what you do and don't want to do because you don't do much of anything at college you do a lot of a little bit of everything yeah um to kind of just give you the starter to then get you into university if you want to go to university and then kind of specialize in something did you ever consider going to university i applied but i never was gonna go no no it, i only applied because it was a part of the college yeah it was a thing to you, do you had, you had to apply you didn't have to but they, they wanted you to. you to give you the option so if you did want to go if you did change <laughs> your mind you had the options to go um, yeah, that makes sense but i for me like university and it has zero value for doing anything creative it's like just go and be creative go and work yeah. it out yourself like <clears throat> i i think it just slows you down really and gives you a fuck ton of debt mm. and doesn't really add any value like this especially nowadays like what they will be teaching at, u- at university you can learn online in a day really if you want to go and learn something specific it's just like video editing like yeah you want to go to university and spend a hundred grand at university to, to learn how to video edit, or do you want to learn free or, or off YouTube? It's like well, that's it. There's there's thousands of yeah. video editing. You didn't do tutorials. uni, did you? No, I didn't do uni either. And I only did uni because I was kind of forced. I wouldn't yeah, but have done I think, it otherwise. I think the difference for you is like you have you you needed the qualification to do what you wanted yeah. to do, and I I I totally think university for like. Being a therapist, being a doctor, being what like an actual like a real oh, yeah. job, like a real job, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, I've got a flashback to yeah. when one of the grandchildren said to you, Uncle Ooh. Will, when are you going to get a proper job? Literally, really, little fucker. Yeah. Wow, Bert- yeah. Bertie, it was Bertie, wasn't it? When are you going to get a real job? Yeah, yeah. It was like three years old. <laughs> Can you believe that? Where do you learn that from? Boring dad, Tim. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Sorry, then, I, guess, I guess that's the question, though. Is at what point did you, at what point did you think that yes, this is a job? When I was twelve years old, yeah, or eleven, when I went to see Faithless, yeah, that's that's the moment when you thought, yeah, that's what I want to do, and that's I had nothing else. Okay. Like it was rugby or music. There was I mean, that's a really young age, isn't it? To know yeah. exactly. Yeah, what yeah you I was super do. super fortunate. Like. Really fortunate. If you speak to your, your nephew, who is, is he 10? Yeah. You asked him now what, what he wants to do. Probably a two gamer. Years time, probably a gamer. Yeah, yeah, he wants to be a gamer. Yeah. Is that a proper job? Yeah, yeah, it, yeah is. it is. You get paid lots of money <laughs> to be a gamer. Great. Great. Yeah. I wonder if Bertie would say that. <laughs> but Bertie definitely wouldn't say that. <laughs> um, You'd have to be a fireman or something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. But I don't know. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's, it's super young, but I... I don't know. I guess like, yeah, I don't know. I don't really know why I chose it, but I'm screwed if I don't because it's <laughs> got nothing else. But you now, clearly like. enjoy it as well because you, yeah, you, you you put your entire 125% of life into it. Yeah, it's all, so. it's all I want to do really. Yeah. But I, we were a very musical family though, weren't we? Yeah. In we, that sense. Not, not that we all played instruments and stuff mm. like that, but we listened to music yeah. constantly. There's always music on in the background. I sing. Dad tries to sing. You yeah, know, dances terribly. Yeah. He's the worst dancer <laughs> in the world. <laughs> and, <laughs> but yeah, like we, like family trips, like yeah. going to the, 
camping when we yep. were younger and things like that. Like it was all based around music. Mm. Like the old vinyl player at Shipham, like with Beach Boys on. They were like, yeah, like I, yeah, it was just very. We always had fun. I think that was what it was about. I think what was uncanny was that when you were doing your studying, you can remember you had that assessment because you were struggling to communicate. Mm on paper what you need to do and um they did an assessment <laughs> in the special needs bit didn't they with yeah. you they were brilliant it was your PE teacher that said just go and get it. just yeah, go and yeah. check it out this is a king's yeah yeah, King, yeah and um they said and they did this test and they said he has to listen to music the only thing that teaches him that allows him to remember and then be able to transfer it onto paper was music yeah. And so whenever he studied, he had to have music on in the back. Oh, how interesting. And they, they, yeah, they gave me extra time at, at, at uh, exams and stuff like yeah. that because of, yeah. Did they let you bring an iPod in so you could listen to music? There wasn't iPods then. <laughs> of course. Yeah, I suppose it was a bit earlier, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think there was an iPod then. No, I think you're right. I think it probably was a little bit early or just on the cusp When did of... an iPod come? 2006? Yes. No. No, 2007 was the first iPhone. So yeah. iPods would have been you definitely two or three had the first years before. iPhone, didn't you? I did, and and funny enough, you talked about Mr. Weber earlier. He was the person who confiscated it from me. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Your iPod is over there, yeah, sat on my the first window. iPod. Is Your there. first iPod, yeah. and it's actually got a date on it. So it was oh, has it? I was eighteen. Oh wow! That was my eighteenth birthday. First present. iPod. Yeah. When I my first full season in Ibiza. Wow. Yeah. So after your first full season in Ibiza, then what happened next? Um. I got a residency when I was 18. Okay. First, I was, well, Robin asked me when I was 17 if he got a job, wanted to stop doing Ibiza, got a real job. Um, real job. Yeah. yeah. And then um, <laughs> he was like, do you want to be the resident? I was like, okay. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, so I moved out there. I was planning on going anyway, but I didn't really have any. I'd saved up my money for the year so that I know that I could be out there just in case. Yeah. Even if you didn't have a job, you'd be out job, there. Yeah. Um, but luckily I had a job and got it. And yeah, it just start. You, that's when the work kind of set in. Yeah. You know, seven days a week, 12 hours a day. Gosh, that's a lot. DJing. And that's where I really learned how to DJ. Yeah. Like, yeah, that was like the real time of like t the 10,000 hours, if you know what I mean, it's, as such is like, you're really learning to do stuff you're learning by doing and just yeah, doing yeah, it yeah. continuously yeah. for all that time um so we lived my one of my best mates dan he came out with me a guy called max came out with me at the same time as well um and we were all living in a place called rocker park <laughs> <laughs> um, nice. which is like it was like an old hotel that was turned into apartments one bedroom apartment i there was two single beds in the in the room dan and i had the beds max had the sofa max left after a month um yeah and we ended up by the end of the summer having dan fraser who was a mate from here from home i used to work with him in the ledger center as a lifeguard um fraser alexi Dan Fraser, Alexi, Lucy, that was my girlfriend at the time, and myself. So it was a bunch of us <laughs> in a one bedroom apartment again. Wow. <laughs> and at one point, there was somebody else that came in. They would live. They were sleeping on the balcony. Oh my god! Yeah, it was just wild. Oh, but, wow. we went to visit. Can you remember? We had, and they started covering everything up. <laughs> we had porn cards all over one of the doors. Oh really? We were like, quick, take them down. <laughs> <laughs> and who had had? relationships with people and who oh, had a... oh no no that was another oh, one that was a different that place. was another year that was when i was above motor lewis or was it yeah <laughs> good old times wild. good times but yeah it was it realistically i went to ibiza to work okay but like, i had the best time but i worked i was like realistically the only person that i knew at that time my age that was actually earning i was earning more money in ibiza than i was in the uk yeah. as a dj um well it was anything really like i was working at the chip shop then or like no i was a, light, I was a leisure center um yeah and then from then 
from Ibiza, I met a guy called Tom Brown. Um, and Tom, nice man. Yeah, he's one of the nicest guys. But Tom works in radio in Ibiza. Okay, or all around the world, really. He's he's had a lot of experience in radio, and he he ran a production company that would go and record DJ sets on the island for radio stations. He does BBC. He runs the BBC studios there, or the Cafe Mambo studios, which is when the BBC does. Um. Ibiza weekend radio one in Ibiza that's where it all kind of gets broadcast from right so he kind of took me under his arm and employed me as well so I would work at Orange Corner um actually no this is the, this is the year after so I had moved to uh, moved to a place called Kenya which is like a nicer it was an at the time it was a way nicer beach bar on the Sunset Strip. So every night the Sunset Strip is where everyone goes and watch the sunset. Nice. So the famous places Cafe Del Mar and Cafe Mambo, Savannah, and then on you go around the corner and there's Kanya. I was at Kanya at the time, so I would work day night shift in Kanya, and then I'd go to a club after and record a DJ set. Okay. And then every, full on days. Yeah, like. I'd tw- 20 hour days yeah. like we'd and then s- I'd sleep for hours get up get back on it wow. um and yeah I think we would record pretty much every DJ set like around the island different clubs and on a Sunday there was a, a really famous bike called We Love Space um at a, at Space which was like the most iconic club at the time <laughs> yeah. in Ibiza and I we would Tom ran the podcast um, that they would put out, and it was before podcasts. Okay. It was like the first electronic mix podcast, but they'd have interviews and they'd have DJ sets and all of that. And it was a really successful podcast. So we, I helped him record the the sets, and there was a lady called Ruth that would do all the interviews and everything like that. And every, every Sunday, we just did do every Sunday. And they were long days. So I took. The day off from Kanya, I got another DJ to play for me at Kanya right. and then had Sundays off. So Sundays was like my day off, but it wasn't a day off. It was no, you were still a doing lot of work. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but then it got to a point where I beat the kind of, I kind of noticed that like I'm the resident DJ, I'm playing in a few clubs and my career is not really going any further what do I need to do to further my career? And that was produce more music and better music and just kind of hunker down and do that. And that's when I came back and just started producing more. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now here we are. <laughs> <laughs> easy as that. <laughs> it's easy. Was it incredibly, I mean, we've had lots of conversations before, but you've said about how hard of an industry it is a to get into, but also, by the sounds of it, you, you've made so many contacts throughout your years of doing it, even when you were back when you were, you know, 12. Yeah. Um, and I imagine that's helped a lot. I think the whole industry is based on who you know. Yeah. Like, there's a level of talent where you need, like, where talent shines through, your mic's about to fall off, man. Okay. <laughs> Um, producer and you just making sure <laughs> things are good yeah. <laughs> the, there's like a level of talent that like if you're extremely talented you will shine through and people will want you i've never had the extreme talent you know what i mean it's more so been like hard work than over talent so it's like but it is also who you know and there's a level of like you just have to be nice to everyone and work your way up and eventually it kind of pays off if you're working correctly um, and kind of always setting goals and always kind of get into a certain level. Um, and just being, I think it's just being really like self-critical on like how you, are you moving forward? And if you are, how do you carry on moving forward? And also if you're not, what are you doing wrong? Um, and have there been times where you've kind of gone, this isn't working or this isn't quite what I want so oh, loads to change of times. things? Yeah, loads of times. Like the whole, my whole career, like I think it's the whole point of having a career is that you have ups and downs. Like my first 
when music became full time for me, I signed to a record label called Dirty Bird, which before that I had a record on an artist artist label called Worthy. Um the record label was called Anabatic and that the record was called Big Booty. And that was like my first record that had any recognition from anyone. Like a lot of the big guys at the time were playing that. And I quit music after that. I stopped for six months and was like, because I just, <clears throat> I started making music to fit everybody else rather, okay. rather than just doing what I do. Um, and it kind of really, I really struggled. And that was when I was looking at opening the club in Bristol. Um, thank God I didn't. Um, but yeah, I think there's been lots of times like signing to Dirty Bird. Dirty Bird gave me a platform where I could, I was lucky enough to get booked in America a lot more. Yeah. And people, I had a, there was a, a demand, a, a very small demand for me touring. Um, but things run its course and like as an artist you kind of evolve and as a person you evolve and work out what you want to be part of and what you don't want to be part of and i think 2018 i was i i think i'd done the most i'd done 112 shows in a year wow. realistically earn barely any fucking money <clears throat> my managers at the time weren't that supportive um i Full time move to Detroit. It was just like a lot of like change in one year or a couple of years over the time, and I thought like I should be happy. I should be really enjoying this, and I re- I was hating it. It was like the I I really oh, wow. didn't like yeah like my career at that time, and it was because I realistically knew that it wasn't actually going anywhere. It was just going down the pan. Okay, and I think I end of 2018 go so i was touring with dirty bird and i was signing to dirty bird but i i kind of wanted to do my own thing at the, at the point and i wanted to like change the sound of music that i was making and kind of change change the whole vibe of what will clark is as a the perception to the public of what will clark is okay um and I was just like, it got to the end of 2018 and like, I wasn't happy with kind of anything I'd done. Um, and my music taste was changing and I was just like, I have to make a change. So I fired my managers. I stopped releasing on Dirty Bird and made a like conscious, conscious decision to like, I have to progress. I have to do things to progress forward. But it was very easy. Like I could have, I could still be doing the Dirty Bird thing yeah. and I could be at an average level and earn an average way like money and just probably ride it out for the next five years but i saw like me coming into dirty bird and then me looking up to people and then me overtaking them in their career okay and it was like kind of surprising how quickly that happened and i didn't ever like I didn't ever want to have that feeling of like, wow, this person's going to overtake me in my career this quickly. And then it was just constant. I saw it all the time. Um, so yeah, it was, I just needed to change everything, change it's, the team it's, around It's me. quite a brave move Ooh. though, isn't it? And I think that's lots of people in their careers, whether you're in the music industry or you're in my industry or whatever, it's that taking that brave step. And, you know, when we open the rehab yeah it was a brave step you know yeah. it was a remortgage the house da, 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 you know well, it's, it's risk that. isn't yeah, it it's, that, yeah, it's yeah. a risk and you don't you don't know if it's going to work but i think deep down inside it has to work so you will make it work and yeah. you'll do whatever you want to make it work i remember when you guys opened the rehab and you didn't have any clients for however long <laughs> and and then, then you have the first client and you're like okay this is a start but it's like we need 12 more you can't do group yeah. therapy with one client <laughs> one to one um and yeah i think that, i think that's part of it as well is growing up with mum and dad like grew up we didn't grow, grow up wealthy at all and i think like i saw mum and dad always working yeah. always working and i went to work with you most of the time um belmont house 
and then Sefton Park at the time and when you were councillor there before you guys owned it. And then, yeah, so like I always, dad was always away working, but they'd always be around as well. Yeah. Um, Do you think that's what's given you your work ethic? Yeah, 100%. Well, I mean, 100%. you're constantly working, yeah. constantly traveling, and it always baffles me how much traveling you do you know it's been several times where I've, I've come with you and it's it's and you offered you've invited me to come places and um you know you're you're in a you're in a city for like less than a day yeah and i think i just i couldn't cope with that i don't know how you do it how, how do you cope with it i guess have you developed a mechanism for it or is it you got used to it you know what is it i don't know i think you just get used to it it's part of the job, though, isn't yeah. it? I mean, it's part of your work. Yeah. That's your working day. Isn't it? I was listening to a podcast with somebody else the other day, and they were saying that. that I, I'll tell you what, it was the that Alan Carr, is it Alan Carr or somebody Carr book? He Jimmy was, Carr. Jimmy Carr. And he was saying on his in his <clears throat> book that actually if you start moaning about the travelling and you start making it a big deal, then you're never going to be successful. You've got to see it as part of the job. My yeah. job is to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, travel 12 hours to wherever I need to go to, yeah. do an yeah. hour and a half, and then travel back. And it's and I think that's such a good attitude to have. Yeah, I think it's just enjoy, try and enjoy every moment of it, right? And try and, if you can enjoy every moment of it, you... Get your oversaw out, mate. <laughs> <laughs> every if you can enjoy every moment of it, it makes it all way more enjoyable. Don't get me wrong; I don't enjoy the travel all the time. Like right. especially the end of this year, <clears throat> it's like a lot. And yeah. I, I'm at, like I'm I've got one more. It technically this fiscal year, like I've got four, four more, more no, five more shows. Yeah, five. Five more shows and. Do I want to get on a plane? No. Realistically, like I'm playing in Spain tomorrow. I yeah. can't be bothered. Like I leave at 3 p.m., get in at 6 p.m. I play 2 till 4 and then go straight to the airport because I've got a 7 a.m. flight. Yeah. But like. So you haven't even got a hotel booked? <laughs> yeah, we've got a hotel. I'll go to the hotel and try and sleep beforehand. Um, But like the thought of it right now is not a nice thought. However, I know, like, after I've had a bit of time off in January, like, I'd be buzzing to go back to it. And yeah. But it's been a busy year. It's been, like, a lot of back and forth, a lot of transatlantic flights. Um, so, yeah, it's it kind of takes its toll, but it's also, like, I love it. So it's, yeah. it's worth it. Um, and you don't love it. I don't love every show I do. Like, it would be weird for me to enjoy every show. Um, like you've been to some shit shows, really shit shows. <laughs> well, there was a time where I thought you only invited me to the. One, to you did say that. To I him. thought you know, and <laughs> I thought maybe this is a, a message. You know? Yeah, <laughs> and it's like that's the thing is like where my career is at is like not every show's a great turnout, if you know what I mean. And yeah. like you, it, you have to be at a very high level for every show to be, uh high turnout show yeah. it still doesn't mean it's going to be good no and it's going to probably have negatives in a different way well yeah you just you can still have a very bad show and you'll be in front of twenty thousand people yeah and you're just like i just wasn't feeling it or you know the crowd wasn't feeling it or it's off in you if you know what i mean and i think it's that's just life everyone has a bad day yeah but i think as an observer of, i mean i know i'm slightly biased but as an observer of watching you play i mean i haven't hadn't seen you play live mm. till this summer and it was like oh wow you know all these people appeared out of well I don't know where they came from because they weren't there when you and I walked around the venue it's yeah. like where did they come from and it's like it is quite a powerful moment to watch that and yeah. a very proud as a parent it's a very mm. proud moment as well and then <clears throat> I was I was looked at a reel on that you had on Instagram the other day and I remember the conversation we had many many years ago about wanting your own graphics yeah, yeah. did it you know that having that those moments mm. and i thought yeah that's a moment will and it, it is remembering those achievements 100 yeah it? yeah yeah and i think that's it it's just ground like it's looking back if i spoke to my 12 year old self and going this is where you're at like yeah it's mad <laughs> but it's 
what in the moment is what's next yeah. it's like where do we go next and how do we evolve and how do you grow but it's like how do you you still also have to learn to enjoy it and i think I, it's only taken me 2019 was probably the first year where i really like laid off comparing myself to others in the industry and kind of judging my career on other people's careers and kind of getting jealous of jealous of people in jealous or envious i think it's the same really like there's there's always for me there was always a level of jealousy when i saw somebody that was way more successful than me yeah of course and it i think that's quite natural though in any i think so yeah i I think so especially fire lit under you to keep pushing forward but is it okay i'm going to challenge you both because it's not jealousy it's envy because you still want that person to have it but you would like it as well. Yeah, yeah. totally. But I think for Whereas me... Whereas jealousy is you don't want that person to have it, yeah. is it? Yeah. Yeah, I guess you're right. Um, take a clip out of that. You're right, Mum. <laughs> <laughs> Could you repeat that over and over again? Yeah, we can just, just cut it and then cut <laughs> it. It could be your new ringtone. Hey, every day. <laughs> <laughs> Text tone. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I guess... but. The thing is, is it took me a long time to realize that there's space for everybody. Yeah. And it's like, just like in ev- every industry, there's other people that have rehabs. There's other people that have properties and things like that. And there has to be space for everybody. It can't just all be one you, big person. Yeah. And I think it's very naive and very egotistical to think that it should just be all you. Um, so it took me a long time to process that. And that, from me slowly doing that like it's made it way more enjoyable way more enjoyable because it's just it's just me now it's just me and brian and my other team members that are kind of in the peripheries it's just us two and we're just doing what we can and achieving what we can and it's got zero it's got zero on anybody else yeah and it's weird because i sit in a really weird lane where i'm not really associated to anybody which has its pros and cons and I'm not the coolest act in the world Mm -hmm. and I'm not the most commercial act in the world. So it's like, I, I have this fine line that I step where like I play a bit more of a commercial show supporting somebody and then I'll go play quite an underground techno show. But it's like the techno people don't necessarily always want to associate themselves with me. And then the, the more commercial people do, but it sometimes doesn't work because yeah. it's like it's not where I want to be totally, but it is as well. So it's like we're we're just trying to do our own thing, and I think since working out that we just want to do our own thing, it's just way more fun, which is really good because us at the end of the day, there's no point doing something you don't enjoy. Yeah, in and any <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I I would, yeah, no one wants that. No, you don't <laughs> want to get up in the morning and think, oh, here we go again. And yeah. then the next one, oh, here we go. I know we get days like that, but it's not that kind of, you don't want that for your life. If you're not doing something that you're enjoying, don't do it. Mm. Or do it if you need to do it to earn money and then go and do something that you really, really love. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's always a means to an end, right? Yeah, In definitely. certain situations like that. And sometimes you just got to do the shit to get the gold. Definitely. I mean, I'm sure you didn't want a stink of fish and chips for hours on end when you... No. And also, like, working with you guys for the yeah. rehab. Like, as much as I love, had such a good time during that time, like, I knew I didn't. I don't want to be a therapist, and I don't want to run a rehab. No. And no disrespect, like, I grew up in rehabs my whole life, and as much as I love being there, and it's also just, like, I take my hat off to you doing that every day, but I don't want to do it, if that makes sense. And it was great for me to learn, and I, I learned a lot during that and it kind of helped me massively with dealing with people um or particularly difficult people at times yeah a lot of the time (laughs) but also i wonder how much that's influenced you around the fact that you don't drink you don't do drugs yeah you're you you know you have a clean life i think subconsciously maybe yeah um but when you look at your industry as a whole i think there's a lot of people that would automatically think that yeah those are things that yeah yeah i think it's like yeah it is it's part of the industry which 
has its pros and cons, you yeah. know, and it doesn't bother me at all. But I've just like never been into it. Um, and I think growing up with you, you never drank around me. I know Dad did, but like it was never a big part of our family no, culture. No, um, and rugby growing up, I was so focused on being good at rugby that I would even when everyone like starts experimenting with alcohol, well, it was alcohol, yeah, at the time. Um, it was never for me. Yeah, I never really did. Um, I imagine that you know, if you if you were a, a drinker, you know, you just wouldn't be able to get a twelve hour flight, play a show. You wouldn't enjoy it. No, you wouldn't enjoy. It. And I, a lot of my friends do. Um, and now the industry is turning way more healthy, health conscious, yeah, and like mental health conscious as well. But yeah, I've got friends that like one of my really good friends he had like a drinking problem in the industry He's sober now but like the amount of money he would spend on missed flights <laughs> yeah like he's <laughs> it's crazy he had to at one point <coughs> he was in dallas woke up missed his flight and there, and he was headlining a festival that day oh wow if you're headlining a festival you're earning very good money, good money. um but there was no flights and the only way he could get there was by a private jet. Wow. Flight, not by a whole private yeah. jet, but by a flight. Charter a flight. But like, that's like 25 grand. So like, even if you're earning 50 grand, I know he was earning more, but like, I, I don't know, but I presume. Um, like you're spending all your fee on, yeah. on that. And imagine that's once a month, twice a month. It's like you're... The productivity is just not it's not there right. and then <laughs> i think it's also it's like we don't work we don't have a normal life really and i think with drugs and alcohol can get in the way and it's eventually gets to a point where you're partying all weekend with all your friends and then when all your friends go back to work on monday what are you doing yeah and it's if unless you're very um resilient yeah or like yeah or what's the word um if you're very like routined mm. and willing to just push through and like get in the studio and do what you have to do it's very easy to just wake up and start partying by yourself and then that turns into worse situations and well, it just hurts your health doesn't it yeah and then the you turn in, yeah so i think like it's a, it's a, for me, it's like always been really important to like have a life outside of music and treat it like a job. So it's like I wake up, I go to the gym every morning, I will go into the studio every day if I've got the studio. Maybe not so much now. It's, it's changed a lot in the last, since COVID. It's like my whole routine has changed to a certain extent, but it's still, I still work every single day. Um, and you still go to the gym every day. If you I can. still go to the gym every Wherever day. Wherever you are yeah, in the yeah. world, you go to the gym. So, uh, yeah, I think the whole like health thing is just <clears throat> doesn't appeal to me. Yeah. So, where do you see yourself in 12 months' time? Or what are your goals for the next? I think just keep write better music. <laughs> you always say that. Yeah. <laughs> if I had a quid for every time you said that, yeah. I'd be a millionaire. What I want to know is, is, is <clears throat> when you are writing music, when do you know it's done? Because I know that you're a bit of a perfectionist, so... Yeah, I'm... Music's... For a long time, it, I was... I, my process of writing music was, like, I'd write it in a day or a couple of days and it would get done. The last, like, year, after COVID, it was like, okay, I need to, like, really change my process and, like, really perfect it. And try and make it as good as I possibly can rather than yeah. just, like, willy-nilly throw it out. Um... So like I'm working on a project now and it's like a it's a much bigger process of like, okay, I'll go into a session with this writer, a singer, songwriter, or a pianist or whoever and write the record. I will then go back into the studio a month later and rewrite the record. And then I'm about to do a listening session with Ryan in a couple of weeks to go through all of this music and go what's good 
what fits and then chuck out everything that's been that doesn't fit and then okay. go and write another 30 records that do fit with that other two three records that we have and then also how do i make those five records that we picked fit better so it's like for me it's like the process is much more like i want to put the best possible music out where before it was more so quantity okay um it was just like i just i i know what works in a club and it's very easy for me now to write a club record that's going to work on a dance floor is that going to work in a more commercial sense probably not and i'm not saying i'm trying to write more crossover music but i also am i want to i want my music to be listened to way more people than just people in a club of course yeah so it's like it's a fine line but it's also i just it's just a massive challenge for me and i've i've got a lot of peers that are extremely successful in the pop world and although the pop world doesn't really appeal to me there's where a, the money is though right there's there's money in both there's money in both so if you the difference is with in the pop world you're making money on your actual music in my world you're making money on the shows yeah and a pop unless you're like harry styles well you're making money everywhere <laughs> um <laughs> but like in a pop world especially the way it works nowadays with streams is like you could be making really good money on streams because your streams are getting put in the right playlist and it's doing well on radio and things like that but you might not necessarily even sell any tickets no, of for a show um whereas us is very much based on you're not making so much money on streams at all in comparison to pop music but you're you're selling tickets because people want to go see you at the club um so yeah it's it's very different but i kind of want to be at a point where i can make a very good living with both and it's very it's doable but it's just you just have to make better music what's the biggest crowd you've ever played at um i think like twenty thousand. i think but you just there just comes a point where you just don't even notice it, yeah. it's like you can only focus on one or two people and sometimes you can't focus on anyone because they're just so far away it's just like eh. Just people <laughs> just don't, <laughs> press, just people. don't press the wrong button <laughs> <laughs> talking of buttons i think we probably got to call it a day so yeah. thanks for your time no thanks worries so. thanks for having me it's a pleasure